Hey there friends, Dave Pilatus, Canine and Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. A couple of things. First of all, a lot of you are asking, Dave, where are the movies? I told you before that uh, the prior distributor of our movies decided to stop paying us. We didn't get any money for a year. Still haven't been getting paid. Able to get our rights back to the movies and they should start going up sometime in the next month. And that's a relief to us because that destroyed us financially. And one of the reasons why I have not produced a movie in the last year is because I don't have the money to do it right now. So just want to let you know that that's what happened. I've said it before in other videos. But uh, in Missing 411, the UFO connection, you can get that movie from us on DVD. Our website, NA, like North America, NABigfootSearch.com. Go to the online store. In that movie, we interviewed a series of MUFON people. One of them was a city attorney in Wyoming named Richard Beckwith. And Richard's also the state director for MUFON in Wyoming. Super smart guy. He was in our movie. I don't know if you remember seeing him, but if you want it, check it out. He wrote an article here that I think was very revealing. And the title is The Battle for Disclosure. I'm not going to read it all to you, just part of it. Like all wars preceding the battle for UFO disclosure, the conflict invariably boils down to the haves keeping something from the have-nots. There's great power in knowing something others do not. In the context of UFO secrets, most Americans agree that the U.S. government knows more than it's telling us about UFOs. From the first public rumblings surrounding the subject in 1947 until 2017, the government denied the very reality of the phenomena, undertaking a sophisticated campaign of public denial and ridicule to undermine the truth of it. Now, think of UFO, like Richard has written here, and just put Bigfoot instead of UFO. Since the authentication of the Tic Tac and Go Fast videos in 2017 and the subsequent official admissions that the phenomena is real and its origins unknown, those who keep the secrets have doubled their efforts to conceal the ultimate truth, but so the seekers of the truth have doubled their efforts to reveal it. Therein lies the rub. As in all battles, there are opposing forces at play, divergent factions, and scariest factions within factions who rarely work together, but who may occasionally cooperate when the mutual interests coincide. In this case, the strong opposition, opposition to disclosure derives from several exceptionally threatening sources. Of course, some of them are our government. When I first read that article, I immediately thought about Bigfoot. I've told you before, I think Bigfoot, UFOs, it's all related. And our government has taken on this campaign to hide the truth from you. There's no doubt. And I think some of the people who are effective and in making some inroads into those equations are attacked. Some of you have seen my Wikipedia page, all out, blatant attack, total lies. And unfortunately, there's a lot of the public that goes to Wikipedia and still believes it's true. And then we go to the attack right here on YouTube. If you haven't read the comments on my videos, you need to read them because I've been putting them up there. Every time somebody says they've been unsubscribed, I put it up. It's a huge percentage, folks. That's a direct attack. Now, some of you have heard that our government has paid to squelch truth. It's true. They've, they've had departments in the government that have done this. But how far does the government go in doing that? This isn't a political equation. This is our government. 
And if they're willing to go to extremes to keep the truth from you, then squelching somebody, demeaning somebody, obviously they have no issue with that. That's where we are today. As long as I try to get the truth out to you, and I'm speaking the truth as I know it, which I am, I'm sure that I'm going to continue to be put on a thumb and pressed down into the ground. I'm sure that the subscriber base here will continue to go down. I'm sure that my revenue at 50% of what it was a year ago will continue to go down. And we are actively looking for a secondary place to put our videos. Hopefully that'll come to fruition soon. But the battle for disclosure, in years past, I used to think that it would get there. I don't think so. Congressman Tim Burchett from Tennessee, good friend, is trying to push that disclosure. And he is coming up against some of the toughest resistance he's ever seen on any topic anywhere. And that's scary because the Congress is in charge of oversight. And if our government is doing something and they're concealing it from Congress, then they'll, they'll for sure conceal it from us. Okay, let's get going on missing people. The first case is a double disappearance, really unusual. Involves two brothers, Dan and Mike Gorman. Mike was 19, Dan was 22. Mike lived in Minneapolis. Dan lived with his wife and their five-month-old child in Columbia Heights, Minnesota. And he was involved in building maintenance as an occupation. Both of them went missing November 8, 1977 in the Beltrami State Forest in Minnesota. And oh boy, do I know that area. This is the city of Baudet, Minnesota. This is Beltrami State Forest, Beltrami Island. This whole area is so thick, so filled with water, it'll blow your mind. It's a really tough area to hunt because there's not a lot of open space, but it's remote enough that you don't get a lot of people in there. Now, the Gormans set up a trip with three other people, some friends. And the five of them arrived at their campsite in the Beltrami State Forest. They started to establish their camp and three of the other hunters, not, not the brothers, three of the other hunters wanted to go into town and get some supplies to last them a step for a few days. Well, the boys said that they were going to stay behind and go deer hunting out in the woods and they'll all meet when they come back from camp from the city. Great. So the three guys leave. Dan and Mike grab their rifles and they take off and they go into the woods. The three other guys said that the boys were wearing bright orange light coats and bright orange hats. One of the requirements to hunt in Minnesota is you got to wear bright orange. Same in Montana. The friends said that the boys were not dressed overly warm and that the boys were not experienced hunters. They'd gone a couple times in the past, never shot anything, never killed anything, had no experience really in this area. But they were old enough and everyone thought that they were mature enough and smart enough to take care of themselves. Well, at 8 p.m. that night, the three friends that went into town got back, got into camp, and they didn't see the brothers. They honked the horn, they flashed their lights. They didn't show up. 
They thought maybe they'd make their way back within the next couple hours, so they waited till 10 o'clock. And then one of the other three hunters, a man named Perry Magnin, the most experienced of the hunters, extremely experienced, and the brother of the woman married to Dan Gorman. So he had a family tie there. He leaves to get to a phone and he calls Lake of the Woods deputy, uh, uh, the county sheriff named Dallas Block, quite a name, and reported the boys missing. Dallas said he'd send out some deputies. So that night, about an hour later, a deputy arrives at the camp, interviews the hunters. They want to know what the hunters are wearing, what they're armed with. Did they have a compass? Did they have maps? They didn't have anything. Yeah, they didn't have anything. They didn't have a flashlight. They didn't have matches. They were very ill-equipped. Now at about this time, late at night on November 8th, it starts to snow. How many times have I told you that weather is one of those profile points? It is here. And there's swamps and bogs everywhere in this area, water. Hunters being a subgroup. Point of separation being when one group leaves and another group goes into the woods. Point of separation. While the sheriff interviews the three guys, they can't add a lot other than what they're wearing, the experience level, the names. And the deputy there makes a call for search and rescue in the morning and a call out. And they're hoping that weather's going to get better because now it's getting worse. Snow is falling harder. Well, the next day, November 9th, it's really snowing. They've got a foot of snow last the previous night. They have 50 ground searchers, four planes lined up. But they use the ground searchers and they start at the camp and they start searching outwards. They have some canines. Canines aren't picking up a scent. There's drifting snow. On the 9th, they couldn't accomplish a lot because the weather was blowing hard, it was cold, and snowing hard. So they called off the search early on that day. Late that night, it stopped snowing. They got two to three feet of snow during that night and the following day. So on November 10th, they had 150 ground searchers that they were able to get in. Skies were clear. And the Civil Air Patrol assigned four planes to fly the area. And they also had three National Guard helicopters. And the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources had 20 different wardens that were assigned. And they were all looking for something that you just couldn't miss. Bright orange parkas. But they didn't see them. Remember 11th. Aircraft continued to fly in the air. They had 200 ground pounders now. They had ATVs. This forest is very lush, very thick, lots of bogs, lots of water. On that day, the mom of the boys named Carmen, Carmen Gorman, talked to the press. She said something heartbreaking. She said she had just lost her husband and the thought of losing her two boys was too much. And she needed everyone to pray that they come back. Said she couldn't cope with it. Well, Perry Magnan, Nancy Gorman's brother, most experienced hunter, never left camp. Some of the other guys left when the search started. Perry didn't. He was one of those experienced outdoorsmen and said, hey, I, I can be just as good as any of the searchers. Put me out there in the field with anybody and I'll do twice as much ground. And he stayed around, paid the price. November 12th, the search and rescue zone expanded. They weren't finding anything. 200 searchers were on scene. And then November 13th through the 15th, 
200 searchers, two helicopters, and two planes stayed in the air and searched and searched and searched. The area kept getting larger, but they weren't having any luck. On November 15th, there was a press conference and the sheriff, Lake of the Woods, said that they were going to terminate their effort. They hadn't found anything. They gave it almost a week. There's no way the boys could be living like this. It had rained and snowed. And they called it. Carmen was crushed. Now that's something I, I, I was thinking about that. Imagine losing your husband and then who you relied on for moral support and love, the two boys, and now they're gone. Who do you have? It's just you against the world. Horrible. But that wasn't the end of the story. About six months later, May 2nd, 1978, the Department of Natural Resources, which had several planes attached to it, assigned a couple of planes to fly over the area again because the snow had melted, it was spring, they were just gonna give it another shot. Another pilot, is. this is what the pilot said, quoting him, Dan Gorman's body was found in open space surrounded by bushes by pilot John Parker of the Department of Natural Resources pilot flying over the area. He saw it so late in the day he had to wait. And on May 3rd, they recovered the body of Dan Gorman. They said nothing about the condition of the body, nothing about the cause of death, nothing about what he was wearing. Phenomenally quiet. They did say that they were going to start searching for Mike. They searched for, they searched the area again for another four days, never found Mike, end of the search. Let me tell you something. I know this area pretty well. Spent considerable time up here because Ben was in just outside, well, just north of Bemidji at a hockey camp for 10 years. Every summer I'd go into this area. And in fact, I sent Harvey Pratt into uh, some Native American land just south of this over some Bigfoot sightings that I was personally told from witnesses. And then when I was there, I met some people that ran a body shop. This is this was a nice business. And I said, you know, you get people in here, you ever get stories? And he goes, well, I lead some of these searches. I go, what do you mean? He goes, we have a lot of strange stuff up here, Dave. I go, what do you mean? He goes, we have UFO sightings all the time. And he told me that uh, right up in this area, the Mississippi River has its headwaters. One time somebody was hiking through the woods and they looked out and there's your classic cylindrical UFO hovering 15 feet over the Mississippi River. And the river there is like the size of a large creek. But he goes, yeah, it happens all the time. And the number of Bigfoot sightings there is huge. And again, tons of water, very rural area, not a lot of people up there. One thing I will say the area has has mosquitoes the size of small birds. <laughs> it's rough. But anyhow, when I saw this disappearance, I thought, well, it's pretty remarkable. And then also, I, I wrote a very famous story out of this area, right where the Gormans disappeared, very close. Another pair of hunters disappeared under almost as very similar circumstances. And one of the hunters didn't return. Huge search. Months later, they're flying over the area. And a long ways from where he disappeared, his body's found naked, laying in a swampy area 
on dry land. Needless to say, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to say why the body was there, etc., etc., etc. So I rank this area up there in my top 10 of the strangest areas where people have gone missing. Next story. Francis Hamlin, 61 years old, disappeared November 26, 1964 in Henderson Brook, Maine. He, had, he was a 40-year trapper working the same area. 61, but he'd been trapping for 40 years. Each year, Francis would be dropped off on the pond, on Henderson Pond, by a float plane. And then later on, he'd be picked up at the end of the season and flown out. Each November, Folsom Air would land on the pond, <clears throat> walk over to his camp, pick him up, pick up all the uh, pelts that he had, and fly him out. Now, where is that? Well, this is East Millinocket. Millinocket here. This is the pond they were at. Give you a little closer look. Very rural, ponds everywhere. The U.S. border is about 10 miles this way from that location. And then Canada's right there. Oh, sorry. Hawk. <laughs> so, Francis had left a note with a caretaker of the adjacent pond, which had a resort on it called Long Pond. And he left the note and said, hey, could you get a note to the pilot service that I need to be picked up on December 15th? Caretaker saw the note, placed a call into the air service, and had it all set up. Perfect. Well, December 15th, the chief pilot for Folsom Air was a man named Charles Coe. Charles landed on the pond, had made this trip several times before in picking up Francis, spotted the plane on the shore, walked over to the camp, couldn't find Francis. I knew Francis and knew that he was a very conscientious man, didn't want to make people, didn't want to make people wait was timely, on time always. So Co knew something was really wrong. So he walked around the camp, looked in the tent, and he knew Francis kept a daily diary. And it was sitting there on his desk. So he looked at it, and it said the last entry was November 26th. Co knew then something was really wrong because Francis wrote in it every day. So he thought, well, maybe, the, you know, 61 years old, maybe he died around camp. So he spent a good 45 minutes walking around the camp, looking, searching, didn't find anything. And he got in his plane, flew out, and called the main warden service. And he also called Francis's son, who lived in Milo, Maine. Well, the son got together with the warden service. And the next day, December 16th, they flew in there. And wardens Ernest McAllister of Abbott and Charles Howe of Greenhill accompanied Francis's son into the camp area. And what they were looking for is Francis's main trap line to see if it was secured and it was in the cabin and put away for the season, or was it still out? And they were surprised to see that it was still out. Well, they talked it out and everybody was of the consensus that the thought of Francis getting lost 
was 100% discounted. He spent too many years in that area and there was no possibility he's going to get lost. Then they thought, well, maybe he was robbed and killed for his pelts, except that he had a small cabin and inside were his stack of pelts ready to get flown out. But they were still in the building. They weren't out ready to be taken to the plane. And then they did look at the diary. And with the last entry being November 26th, knowing that 19 days had passed and nobody had seen him. December 17th. Oh, by the way, the trap line, they found it. And there were animals tied to the, tied to the trap line that looked like they'd been there for several weeks. December 17th, more wardens arrived. Search and rescue area was expanded. And the wardens went over to Long Pond and interviewed the caretaker who hadn't seen anyone in the area for months. And again, the concern was maybe a hunter accidentally shot him. Maybe there was some competition going on for trapping. No, the caretaker essentially annihilated all those. December 18th, the third day of the search and rescue, Francis' son stayed in the camp and searched. People described the disappearance as very perplexing. How such, how such an experienced outdoorsman could completely disappear. He didn't have any type of motorized vehicle to leave the area, no boats. His entire existence centered on a two mile by two mile area where he did his trapping. Summer of 65, there was an additional search of the area by the warden service that lasted three days. Found nothing. Now, when we found this case, I immediately thought of one of the biggest stories I ever wrote about in my books. And it involved two main wardens two of the most experienced wardens in the main service. They were 30 miles north of where Francis disappeared, 10 miles from the Canadian border, and they were working in an area where they had a lot of animals disappear. And they thought that poachers were coming across from Canada and taking the animals. So they sent the two most experienced guys up there. They disappeared. And when I saw Francis's story, I immediately thought of that story. The story about the two wardens is in Missing 411 East, Eastern United States. It is a fascinating story to me for sure. And um, there's a lot, there was a lot I could find about it. Francis was never found. Now I find the life of a trapper interesting because there's much competition for, for the pelts. Uh, there's a lot of animals that eat those beavers and mink, etc. But again, Francis knew this area. He never had any problems. How could he just merely disappear? Which is really what you ask about all these cases. So I appreciate you being here. And I would greatly appreciate it if you could share this on your social media. I'm reading all those comments you put on the videos. So if you're unsubscribed, say it. If you want to get my books, go to NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com and go to the online store. And you can get our DVDs there too. So I'm sorry the videos aren't up right now, but DVDs are still available and Blu-rays. So in the meantime, 
be nice, be kind. Do something kind for somebody in your area. The kindness revolution. Politis out.